who is the press. Um, I'm Ronelle Anderson-Jones. Uh, we uh, are tasked here uh, with the very tiny task <laughs> of uh, thinking about how we identify the entities that are now performing the core press functions. Uh, and also um, sort of more critically, what benefits and challenges accompany broader and narrower legal and constitutional definitions of the press. Um, this uh, panel is in many respects, I think, a really great landing spot uh, for uh, the arc of conversation that's been had over the, the course of the two days here at this conference, because it's um, something that has been touched on in so uh, many earlier conversations. And here we're tasked um, with sort of tackling it more squarely. Uh, again, our panelists' full bios are going to be linked here in our um, webinar chat and also on the conference webpage. Uh, but we do have an all-star crew here to lead the discussion, and I'll give you the, um, the highest order introduction uh, to them. Uh, Dave Schultz is senior counsel for the media practice group at Ballard Spar and a Yale research scholar who ably heads the mafia, um, which we are obligated to clarify is just the acronym um, for the Media Freedom and Information Access Clinic. Uh, he is not um, an actual mafioso. Um, uh, uh, contraire. <laughs> to my knowledge. <laughs> uh, Amy Guida is a former broadcast journalist and professor of law at Tulane whose work focuses on media law and privacy issues and whose book, uh, The First Amendment Bubble, How Privacy and Paparazzi Threaten the Free Press, uh, speaks to this panel's uh, tricky tensions. Uh, and we um, hope to be joined after we uh, work out some, uh, some glitches um, with Jamal Green. Um, a uh, professor at Columbia Law School whose impressive body of uh, scholarly work and uh, public commentary focuses on the structure of legal and constitutional argument and who also um, has past life as a reporter. Okay, uh, so it's, it's great to see um, you all here. Um, Dave, I wanted to start with you in, in, in part uh, sort of asking you to kind of set a table for us because of your experience as a media lawyer and especially um, your recent experience at the Yale Clinic. Um, uh, you've seen a lot of subcontexts where our question seems likely to arise. Um, statutory protections, access issues, uh, the subsidies that were suggested in earlier panels, and especially uh, the constitutional doctrine discussed in just the last panel. So um, I thought um, maybe we could launch just as a starting matter um, that uh, you could kind of give us the 33,000 foot view um, generally describing what you might classify um, as the kind of core press function cases. Uh, what are the kinds of behaviors or contributions that we might care about uniquely protecting? And as a companion to that, why context could matter here? Yikes. Okay. <laughs> I feel like we're doing a bait and switch. I, I think I'm on the last panel. I, I was already talking about definitions, but we can talk about functions because I really think they're they're the one in the same. They're two sides of the right. same yes. question, as you said. I mean, when Sonia said she was looking forward to this panel to answer her concerns <laughs> about how we define it, I figured after the last panel, it would be a simple task because I do think that the definition has to flow from the functions. You know, and as a media litigator over the years, I've always dealt with this issue in um, in, a, in a specific context and never have had to like get my head above the above the um, the the, the um, the shoreline and, and look ahead. Um, and so in context, it, it seems like it, it, the, the definitional arguments flow from the context and the reporter's privilege, we know from, from all the states that have, have developed statutes, uh, there's various ways of, of defining who the press is for that function. Um, in the access area, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, in the first case to recognize a constitutional access right, uh, Justice Berger very definitely called it a public right because it was in that phase when the court was saying there are no special rights for the press in a whole series of cases and, and in a sense that's good because it, it resolves certain things um, but one of the things my clinic has done is to try to articulate what what are the underlying constitutional concerns uh, for an access right uh, and tie it more specifically to the first amendment um, press clause, you know, because I think the, you know, one of the arguments we make from a functional standpoint is that, that the right of access exists as a structural right. This is what uh, Justice Brennan said in, uh, in Richmond newspapers in his concurrence. And, and it's an argument that Justice Powell made back in 1974 in a famous speech called or of the press, that there's a structural role. Um, and 
just to, to harken back to the last panel, I, I, I recognize uh, what Jeff Stone was saying, that there are a lot of difficult definitional issues that have to be faced. But, and the court has, has used that, particularly Justice Berger as an excuse in Bilotti and in other, in, the, in, in the Brandsburg, um, the court said, you know, it's too hard. In Bilotti, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Berger said, we don't want to go down the road of defining who who is a who gets the press protections because that sounds like a licensing scheme, and you know it's kind of a, a a glib answer that's not very intellectually honest about what the press clause is trying to do. It's a boogeyman to say, oh, we don't want licensing of reporters without looking at the underlying concerns. And I think one of the reasons the court kind of went that route is that it's troubling to the court as an institution to think that there is and institution, the press, that receives constitutional protections specifically so that it can act as a checking uh, function, provide a check on the government. It's an independent source of power that was written into the constitution. And I think that, that makes the court nervous. And so they've been happy to let this um, wither on the vine because it, you know, it would be a competing power source. But having said that, the question then becomes, you know, what are the definitional issues. And I guess just one other thing I would say is, you know, the, the, where we focus in my clinic in, in, on this issue is, is one is trying to expand that constitutional right to say that it, it isn't just a right to court access. It's a, a public right of access, which means specifically in many cases, a press right of access to those government proceedings and functions that the public must know in order to um, assure itself that constitutional constraints are being carried out. Right, so that's how we look at it, and uh, as a definitional thing. So it's obvious that you need a public right of access to courts if all the protections in the Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment are being carried out. We've been arguing in a couple cases now uh, that there is a constitutional right of access to executions to know if the Eighth Amendment, and and there are analogs to that. You know, where where due process is required in administrative proceedings, must there be public proceedings? But so. So part of the, the argument that we've been doing in the clinic is trying to expand this. And, it, and the two areas where, where the law is least developed is in the area of access and in the area of news gathering rights. The court has been very reluctant to say there is a First Amendment defense to laws of general applicability. So that's what, what we've been focusing on. Should I stop for a minute to say hi to Jamal? <laughs> yes, hi. Hi, Jamal. Hi. <laughs> Um, so glad that you could join us. Uh, we have introduced you, uh, so uh, your reputation quite literally precedes you uh, in, in terms of the introduction. Um, uh, Dave was just setting the table for us here by thinking about the array of press functions that we, uh, the, the, sort of the behaviors or contributions that we might want to uniquely protect. Um, and also to think about uh, sort of uh, why context might matter here. Um, Amy, I want to think just for a second with you, uh, although I want to I want to burrow down into some um, nitty gritty examples um, that I know lots of people have asked on uh, previous panels in this very conference and are probably queuing up uh, to ask in um, in the chat and Q and A. But I want to tap in sort of at a high level um, again, just sort of laying uh, the groundwork here about um, some of the work that you've done focused on legal standards that defer to news judgments on newsworthiness in cases involving journalists. Um, and, and I think the piece of it that I'm most interested in for this conversation is sort of where you landed about um, what best advances the goals we're talking about here, um, are, are the democratic goals of press freedom here. Did your investigations in this area offer any insights uh, that you think are useful to this wider question of whether a, a bigger or smaller tent approach to who counts as the press is more protective of the overall democratic and societal values in the area. Well, I think what, what I'm most concerned about is as courts restrict certain uh, publications, uh, that those restrictions could, in fact, cause uh, more legitimate media than to cut back. So there could, in fact, be a very um, a chilling effect on uh, mainstream uh, legacy media uh, when courts push back on um, what we might call uh, just regular publishers. Um, and I guess I can give you a, an example of this in thinking about access, um, David, um, which isn't going to parallel exactly what you said, but um, but 
think about uh, how routine mugshots were. So access to mugshots were when, when I was a reporter, certainly uh, we could get them whenever we wanted. Uh, within the past um, couple of years now, uh, all federal appellate courts that have decided the case have decided that we no longer can get access to mugshots um, on the federal level. Uh, and that's because there are privacy interests in those, um, those mugshots. Uh, and, uh, and it's because of websites that publish mugshots routinely. And so, so with any, without any sort of um, news assessment or, or, um, or things like that. And, and if there is that level of pushback then uh, in terms of access, uh, there's also a similar um, uh, pushback um, uh, against um, uh, truthful news. So coverage of auto crashes, for example, there have been um, uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress claims that have moved forward uh, against regular publishers. And in each of these cases, the courts will say, we're not deciding this involving a journalist. This is a publisher. This is not a journalist. And so courts are, at least um, by my read, they recognize the difference. They believe that the decision that they're making will have no effect on journalism, but ultimately it does because, um, because there's been restrictions. There's, there has to be a chilling effect when we know that there is um, the possibility for an intentional infliction of emotional distress claim from an auto crash that can affect um, legacy media as well. So Amy, um, what's your response to uh, the sort of comment that we've heard a couple of times about um, the sort of notion that uh, if everybody is the press, then nobody is the press, right? Uh, that that uh, the notion that if there are these sort of core press functions that we need preserved and courts aren't going to be willing in sort of the examples that you've given to throw open the doors broadly uh, to uh, whatever kind of uh, right or protection might be at stake there, uh, that we risk collapsing the whole framework um, with too broad a definition. I, what are your, what's your response to that? So I, I think that that's exactly right. And you see that in some of the reporters' privilege cases. Uh, so, um, so in some of the broader statutes, uh, when, when courts will take a look at whether or not someone is due some, some level of protection um, and uh, able to assert a reporter's privilege, uh, if the statute itself is too broad, you can tell that courts are, um, uh, uh, there, there's, there's a pushback uh, against that. And so uh, in a recent decision where um, uh, a court decided that a website was due uh, a reporter's privilege, uh, there's a little um, mention in dicta that suggests that uh, if a law firm publishes a blog, that law firm will be a journalism entity uh, and uh, with the court's frustration that it should not be that broad. So, uh, so um, mm -hmm. and I think especially when we think about the people at the Capitol riot, um, when we think about other uh, uh, people like that who will in fact claim journalistic privilege and otherwise, um, it's, it's important to, uh, to hone in on, on exactly uh, who is a journalist as we're talking about today. Excellent, thanks. Okay, so I have one more sort of broad table setting question um, for Jamal uh, before we burrow into some sort of um, technical, more technical questions about how we would draw lines in particular instances. Um, and Jamal, I'm particularly interested in talking with you about these topics because some, I think some of the most important scholarly work that you've done has really honed in on these questions of the uh, sort of structures of um, legal and constitutional decision making, sort of the, the approach that we take. And I, I wanna ask you a question about whether there are or could be meaningful tools for line drawing between various actors who are engaged in behaviors commonly classified as press functions. I'm, I'm interested in your views on all of this, like uh, sort of um, what First Amendment concepts matter to us in these cases, but I'm also more specifically interested in what you know, tools, mechanisms, structures are best suited for deciding the matter. And um, I'm hoping you could sort of chime in on that um, broader question. Thanks, so I'll, I'll try to say a little bit about that. But first, let me apologize for, for stepping into the conversation a little bit late. I, I just got my, my times a little bit mixed up. Um, uh, so, so to the question, you know, I, I tend to think, uh, and I think this is consistent with 
um, some things David uh, mentioned as well. That um, you know, I'm I'm a I'm I'm very much a context all the way down sort of person, um, and I I tend to think the question is more a question of not of who the actors are, but what what their actions are, um, and um, and that means both the 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 putative press entity and also the state. Um, what what is the state trying to do when it regulates um, press in some way, uh, and what is the particular actor trying to do? What are the costs of uh, of regulating their behavior within that particular space? So if you're talking about a law firm that's publishing a blog, just to, just to, to spitball um, from that particular analogy, um, you know the the cost of saying you know that law firm might not have certain protections in putting out that blog is, is going to be different than um, than if it's institutional media um, where that's their bread and butter. That's what they do. Um, they couldn't exist really without being able to report in that way. So I, I think that because this is such a complex media environment, and you do have this um, this issue of if everyone's the press, no one's the press, and, and vice versa, that um, one must simply focus on what the how much the core values of press freedom are being um, threatened or not by a particular within a particular situation. Those core values being access to information that that's relevant to the formation of democratic culture, um, holding political leaders accountable um, would be the would be the, the core ones, but maybe there are others that I'm not thinking of. So 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 I think it's a lot. It's it's less of a line drawing exercise than um, than uh, than a, a, an act of judgment and assessment based on standards rather than rather than rules. And so, what are the things that matter here? You know, we might care rather than saying is this the press or not. We might care about you know in the situation in which we whatever you know, there are a lot of different aspects to this problem, of course, but. It is are we talking about passive or active action? Um, are we talking about something that the particular press entity has brought about themselves? So, um, or or are they responding to to facts on the ground? Um, what is their behavior um, in the particular context we're talking about? Are they behaving as media or as something else? Um, are they reporting on government or are they reporting on private citizens? That also should should matter. Some I think. Um, are we talking about prior restraints of some kind? Are we talking about after the fact um, regulation where the stakes are different in terms of whether the particular reporting gets out or not and how a decision maker might evaluate the action? Um, uh, is what's being targeted the particular action, the reporting itself, or is it the publication? Obviously those are um, those we should think about in, in different ways. Is the government behaving consistently across viewpoint, across time? Um, so, uh, so I, I think, you know, I, and I, I tend to be someone who thinks that it's really the job of courts to, to mix those things, all those kinds of contextual factors together, rather than sort of deciding in some existential sense what, what the press is or, or isn't. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give just one quick, maybe exception to that. Um, that's relevant to, to something I do, which is I, I'm on this oversight board uh, for Facebook. And Facebook also act, acts as a regulator, um, not as a government, but as a regulator of speech uh, on its platform. And um, there, when it's regulating particular content and sometimes having to decide whether that content is more significant because it's newsworthy, um, uh, it, it, it has to make, it might have to make a judgment and I, I think there are good reasons for it to make a judgment as to whether um, some particular entity is the press or not in some more existential sense. And, and part of that is because they're, they're deciding things at scale uh, and, and often engage in algorithmic decision-making. And once you're, once you're at that kind of scale, all of the kinds of contextual factors that I've just mentioned are really hard to, 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 to work through. Um, so depending on that, that's another contextual factor when it comes to government regulation as well as what's the scale that we're talking about. Are we talking about an individual case or, or regulating at scale? And there, I think, you know, whether some institution has a track record or is a, of, of responsible behavior, for example, um, might, be, might become relevant um, when, you, uh, when you can't make a case-by-case -case determination.
Thanks, Renal, yeah. Could I, could I yeah, just uh, comment too? I, I just, I, at, at the 40,000 foot level on line drawing, because uh, I do think that, that Amy and Jamal have touched on a couple of things that, that really should, we should be very clear about. Um, and it, it came up a bit in the last panel. Sonia mentioned that, you know, the press, when the constitution was adopted, the press was a technology. It was like, who owned the press? But there are really two primary functions that, that I think we need to conceive of as being in the press clause. One is what I, we can loosely call news gathering. Uh, and Jamal just said, it's like, it's, it's getting the accountability, the investigative reporting, but it's also just collecting the facts. I think uh, yesterday they talked about the importance of local news. It's the facts upon which democracy functions. If someone's not at the school board taking notes, anyway, so, so there is a news gathering function and there's a dissemination function. And <clears throat> I think for the most part, the law has evolved pretty well, or it's pretty clarified on the dissemination side. Um, there, are, there are protections for matters of public concern and other things, but where we need to be concerned is on the news gathering side. And um, I think that, you know, trying to draw lines about how you define news gathering rights, I think Jay Rosen, has, you mentioned earlier, his distinction of the media is not the press. Well, that, that, that says something, right? It's like the media is the distribution channel. You know, it's like the press in the old technology way. They just, they take content and they find people to look at it. That's what Facebook does. That's what Google does. So in a sense, we can say that's not the press function if we're talking about news gathering. It's something maybe related to the press, but it's not if the press for this purpose. And Jason, well, then how do we define who the press is for these rights? And he defined it as an institution made up of journalists, an institution comprised of journalists who engage in the practices of uncovering and recording information that allows us to function as a democracy. I think that was, was Jay's definition. And I think if we really hone in on that, the definitional question about who is eligible for that um, becomes manageable. You know, and, and Jeff Stone was reluctant to say we should constitutionalize some of these definitions, but it's happened all the time and there's a lot of, of deference to that. And you can go back to the postal regulations. You know, people say, well, you know, the news industry got all these government subsidies because they got free postage. Well, there are very detailed, you know, postal regulations about who is the press that have existed for a long time. And it goes to a lot of different, it, 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 it takes into account a lot of things that should be relevant. Um, you know, if, if you're primarily, if you're more than 75% advertising, you don't get the special press rights. You know, if you, if you don't have a regular uh, circulation list, you know, that you're sending it to, if you don't do it on a periodic basis, and if you don't have certain standards of, of content. So, so there are ways to define who the entities are that are doing that. And perhaps the more useful, and then I'll shut up, but the more relevant um, definitions, because again, in Jay's conception, the press is an institution, you know, Justice Stewart was right. It, we, we protect it because it, it has a structural role, but the institution is made up of individuals. So defining who gets this right, we have to look at the individuals who are doing this function. And in the reporter's privilege area, you know, the, the legislatures have looked at several things. They, they've said, one, you have to be engaged in a certain function, and they define that, you know, gathering, preparing, collecting, writing, editing, filming, taping, that's the New York standard. In the, um, in the federal law that never passed. It was somebody who regularly gathers, prepares, collects photographs, right? So, so you can design, it's, it's this function. And there were two other things to it. It was one, it was you were engaged in this function. Two, you were doing it on a regular basis. Um, and three, you were doing it for dissemination. So that you had to have an intent to disseminate, not just, but the, the regularity becomes a, a, a limiting factor that we should be prepared to accept. And, and in some, some laws, it's like you have to, it has to be, you know, your main profession, meaning you have to make your living off of it, or you have to be doing it with an established institution. And yes, that's a problem. I mean, that's a limitation. But I think if, if we're going to ever come to a definition that has meaning, we're going to have to accept certain limitations. A blogger could be a journalist if that was their full-time job. If it's someone doing it as a hobby and they say, well, I have a right not to go to the grand jury, you know, you say, well, what, what interest is that serving? Anyway. I'll shut up. But I, I don't think these problems are insoluble, but they all flow from what is the constitutional right we're trying to protect. And, and I think and one, I, yeah. I'd love to jump in here just to say that um, I took a look at uh, some very recent reporters' privilege cases from around the United States over the past couple of years. And uh, interestingly, courts are also looking at, I mean, granted, based on language in these statutes, the intent of the individual when the individual shows up at the place to where the news event is happening. So intent when they arrive is something courts are looking at, which I think is super interesting for people who um, 
don't who intend to participate in a rally, for example, and then become uh, some sort of news gatherer, as we saw at the Capitol riots. Uh, and then the the um, the second um, aspect is that they're looking at the end product more, which I think is also very interesting. And so a court recently decided that a self-serving blog, so um, a, a a website um, publisher uh, whose um, uh, website was mostly um, self self interested, um, uh, then did not um, was not able to claim a, a privilege. So uh, so those two areas um, I think might also help us decide um, who uh, who a journalist might be. If this is what if this is what courts are looking at, at least with regard to statutes. No, yeah, that, I think you go ahead, go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to quickly respond oh, just, quickly just a, a quick response to, to, to David, which is that uh, which is that I'm I I I'm I think I'm perfectly willing to accept that the status of of a of an institution as historically conventionally constituted as a news gathering institution should be relevant to, to most of these questions. Uh, uh, and that the, the panoply of rights and duties that attach to the New York Times um, would be different than for a blogger. But I think the I think the corollary to that, which I'm, I'm not suggesting you've necessarily advanced, which is that um, there are no circumstances under which a blogger who a one off blogger who is who is engaged in press like functions. Um, uh, could obtain some privilege that would not ordinarily be, nest, be be applied to someone who wasn't engaged in that activity. Uh, there, I, I, there, I'd be less willing to, willing to go there, um, uh, and that's you know consistent with my my view that this is a spectrum rather than a, an on off switch. Yeah, so it just just to be clear, too, Jamal, what I was saying is a blogger could be eligible for certain rights if it was their full time job. So I'm saying if you go down this road, I'm not saying a one off necessarily. But, but I did want to point, push back a little bit on Amy's point, and maybe she wasn't uh, um, asserting this as something that should be taken about. But, but I think that the, the courts that have said uh, the bias of a journalist or their intent in publishing is relevant to whether they can claim a privilege is absolutely wrongheaded from a constitutional perspective. All of the standards that, 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 that I think we should be looking at, like the postal regs, you can look at the Senate regs. The Senate regs to get a press pass to the Senate gallery are quite amazing to read. You know, you, you can't be a lobbyist. You can't have certain financial interests. You have to be uh, with a daily newspaper. But those are all tied to the purpose for letting the press in. So, you know, again, but there was a case in the, in the Second Circuit several years ago where a, um, uh, a well-known documentarian wrote a documentary called Crude. Uh, about uh, the the mess that was made by I think it was Texaco at the time uh, in uh, uh, Ecuador uh, and the damage that they did down there and left behind and it was then bought by Chevron and there was all this litigation about the movie um, and the Second Circuit said that the the filmmaker wasn't entitled to a, 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 a reporter's privilege because he was recruited to do the film by the lawyers who were pursuing this case. And, and he allowed one of the scenes to be edited to avoid some issue. And they said, well, you're not independent. And the reporter's privilege can only be claimed by someone who's independent. I, I think that's just wrong headed. We should stick to the functions as in the, in the state laws. If you're engaged in doing these things, it shouldn't matter what your purpose is, whether you're doing it for a union, uh, you, could, you could have a reporter's privilege if you were working for a daily newspaper that, that was part of a party organization. As long as you were engaged in the basic function of collecting and disseminating news, you know, or whatever the objective non-content oriented standards are. Right, and what I think is interesting is uh, this pushback on the notion that we are all journalists. Uh, and that's what I think courts are doing right now. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna gel some of the high points that I think that we've, um, that really, really, really important um, territory that I think we've tread here that I think is important for sort of laying the foundation for thinking about some concrete cases. Um, one thing that is an interesting development both from the past, the, set, the previous panel and from this one is um, a, a fairly strong sense that it is um, both healthier and maybe more consistent with the constitutional intent of, the, of um, what the press clause is designed to do 
to be focusing on press functions rather, uh, rather than press, uh, which is to say, um, are you pressing, uh, I, I don't know, the verb, whatever the verb is, are you engaging in being the, uh, being the press is more important, a much more important question for purposes of the kind of protection we ought to be uh, um, allocating uh, and the kinds of rights we ought to be allocating than um, who is the press um, in, in terms of an institution, although those institutional norms and the um, longstanding behaviors might tie in um, to the consideration about whether you are pressing, um, which um, is the wider point that I think Jamal was trying to make for us that this, like all other areas, is an area in which we can um, a, a use a wide array of contextual clues uh, and um, build precedent and multi-factored um, spectrums that help us um, <clears throat> build a body of law over time that protects something that we think is critically important to protect uh, without um, having to have clear on-off switches that, or, or, that, or deciding the whole of the doctrine uh, all at once. Um, uh, thirdly, I think a third thing that has emerged here is that one of the spaces in which we, uh, uh, the, where we're going to be pushed to think about this question is, uh, and this ties into what we talked about at the previous panel, is um, in the space where the broad doctrinal scope of speech clause jurisprudence doesn't already do the heavy lifting. Uh, that is, um, if I'm a publisher, um, right, and I'm, I'm wanting not to have content control of my speech or prior restraint on my speech, those are all things that um, those entities might do in the course of being the press or engaging in the press function, uh, but we have very little concern that those things um, aren't being adequately protected by the speech clause rights that are guaranteed to, um, to everybody publishing in all situations and everybody speaking in all situations. Whereas this, um, this sort of news gathering set of press functions are places where the entirety of this conference has been devoted to serious concern that that uh, um, construction of conversations about matters of public concern and uh, government watchdogging and um, access and accountability function, uh, particularly at a local level, but at every level, uh, might be disappearing. Um, can I hone in for a second and think, uh, so one of the things I wanted, I wanted to echo back, one of the things we've been trying to do here is echo back to previous conversations. Does everybody remember um, in, in yesterday's conversation, uh, Emily Bell made a really, um, I think, interesting comment about how it's a lot easier for us to have instincts about what is not news than about what is news. <laughs> so she said, you know, um, um, uh, propaganda is not news and advertising is not news and activism is not news. But uh, what we want is to think about the converse about what you know, what is news and what is what is a press function here. Um, let me just throw out um, two really hot topic current examples uh, to get um, a feel for what the panelists um, think about some of those dividing lines and the principles we would use for thinking through them. Um, and in particular, I want these examples to help us think, right, not just about the sort of publishing or expressing, but the news gathering activities as press functions, like investigative reporting and exposés and documenting major public events. Um, so I'm thinking, for example, of Project Veritas, um, the James O'Keefe activist uh, group that routinely engages in undercover operations and secret recordings to produce what it would surely attempt to classify as protected journalistic activity um, in uh, alleging misconduct and cor corruption in uh, progressive groups um, uh, and, ma and mainstream media organizations, if we're um, sort of being specific. Uh, a second example is John Sullivan, um, a fellow Utah of mine uh, and an activist um, who filmed the fatal shooting during the storming of the Capitol. Uh, it was charged with being a participant in the riot, but argued that he was a, a journalistic observer. So I'm um, interested in thinking, um, just using those examples as a leaping off point for thinking about the approach that we might take if we, if we agreed at the outset um, with the premises that were put forth in the previous panel, that there is a, um, a, both a constitutional protection for and a dire democratic need um, to engage in some core press functions of investigative journalism, uh, expose reporting, um, uh, uh, undercovering of malfeasance. Um, uh, what kinds of lines would we draw and how could these examples be helpful? Um, Dave, can we start with you and then we'll work our way around? Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, um, I, those are, are good examples. Uh, 
let me take the second one first, because again, I, I would fall back on, on what I was arguing earlier that we should be defining this with respect to what is the activity they're engaging in and are they doing it on a regular basis with an intent to disseminate? So this individual, James O'Sullivan, was it Jim? Anyway, uh, you know, has he been doing this on a regular basis? Does he have a blog that he reports every day? Is he earning income from it? Then yes, maybe. But in each, in each case, <clears throat> you know, there are certain lines that can't be crossed. If he was destroying property or doing other things, that, that the fact that you're a reporter doesn't mean you're free to commit crimes, as Jeff Stone pointed out, for the most part. <clears throat> unless they have more than an incidental impact on your ability to gather the news would, uh, would be my footnote. So I, I think that there, you know, we just go back to the same basic things. I think the same would be true with James O'Keefe, that um, I don't think the fact that he is doing it with a political motive should affect the rights he has to engage in certain um, investigative activities. Again, if he could meet the criteria of what is he engaged in? What was, you know, was it for the purposes of dissemination? Does he do it on a regular basis? Then maybe he, you know, and again, it would depend on what right he was asserting. Is he asserting some confidential source right? Well, then he's gonna have to show that he fits within these areas. Is he asserting it as a defense to a crime that he committed? Well, maybe he should be treated like any other reporter in that context. It, like his motive to, in terms of the story he wanted to tell shouldn't affect the, the, whether he's a reporter or not. But I think you know that, that whether he's a reporter or not is going to depend on looking at his course of conduct over a period of time. No, your thoughts on this? Um, so I, I think I I think I almost entirely agree with with Dave, um, and maybe entirely um, on this on, on both those questions. Unacceptable! I need tension in my panel. All right, I will, I will <laughs> add a I'll add a piece. To you can it. do you can yeah. do improv like yes and I will accept that. So it looks like it looks like Amy's gonna going to push back but but um <laughs> but what, what I'll, I'll try to say something that might be a little bit controversial which, which is that uh in in the project veritas scenario I, I think the the fact that the activity he's engaged in is is a form of entrapment is is should also be relevant um and i think it should also be relevant uh, um in, in part because i think it's i think it's it's borderline in the law enforcement context and so i, I think um when, as we think about what is the what is the what is the value that we are advancing here, or what is lost if we um, if we act in a way that makes this activity less likely to happen? When you're talking about entrapment, what is what is lost is is um, presumably smaller um, if he's bringing about the very the very situation that he's reporting on. Uh, that um, you know may, maybe we've learned that someone has a tendency to be tempted to to abuse if if the situation presents itself and that's not of no value, but it's of less value than if, if they're actively already engaged in abuses. So I, I so I, again, I think that may be a controversial thing to say, but, but I, I do think that, that um, as, as my antennae of what, of why, what a, what a James O'Keefe is engaged in um, might be, might be less worthy of protection. I think that's where it comes from, not from the political motive though. I agree with Dave on that. Right. So if we had um, sort of a spectrum of activity and um, uh, um, a, an expose that was itself setting up um, a dynamic that wasn't pre-existing as compared to say, um, I'll just, this is not, I'm making, not making this up, this is real, but I'm, I'll pretend this, uh, the, our hypothetical will be, um, I apply under false auspices um, for a job at a grocery store where I think that they're putting out meat past the time when they should be putting out the meat and I lie on the application that is I've engaged in some fraudulent behavior but I've done so to get a job at a grocery store where I'm then an insider who is um, uh, writing a news story about a suspicion that I have that health code violations are taking place you see those as different in kind or different in degree <laughs> um so so the, yeah so so different in degree i would say i don't know that i'd say different in kind um mm -hmm. uh uh and, and it also depends on you know i've I, are we talking about pri private actors are we talking about public actors are we talking about celebrities um are we talking about i mean the the the, the standard you know um gertz plus kind of factors mm -hmm. i think i think matt 
should matter in this context. As right. Well. So if I'm exposing that the health department is falling down on the job in a significant way, as compared to exposing that um, the grocery store is falling down on the job, that might also be a distinction. I would tend to think so. Yes. Yeah. Amy. So I think one of the um, interesting cases will be the murder the media uh, journalists who um, entered the Capitol during the riots and live streamed it all. Uh, I think they are going to claim some sort of journalistic privilege. Uh, and if they do, what does that mean? Uh, are they able to then um, uh, uh, not answer questions from police um, and, um, and more? So watch for that because they will claim journalistic privilege. Um, uh, they said that they brought um, press passes with them. I believe that these were press passes created by Murder the Media itself. Uh, and, uh, and so that will be then um, uh, uh, attention um, um, to watch for uh, in the future. Uh, with regard to um, James O'Keefe, there's really interesting things happening right now. I think he is uh, very um, well financed and he's pushing back on, um, on a number of um, uh, laws that he believes um, has uh, hampered have hampered him um, in some way. And in fact, he did send an undercover operative into uh, a Michigan teachers union. Uh, she was um, a person who pretended to be a college student at the University of Michigan. Uh, and she uh, covertly recorded uh, a number of conversations. Uh, and so that's an issue right now being decided by the Michigan Supreme Court. Uh, is it okay to record a conversation if you have just one person who's agreed to record that conversation, or do you need two party consent? So the Michigan Supreme Court is deciding that right now, and it's James O'Keefe at the, the helm of this case. Um, second is um, uh, the First Circuit just decided a Project Veritas case. Uh, and, uh, and in that case, James O'Keefe made the argument that uh, Michigan's law, or sorry, uh, Massachusetts law that uh, makes it a, a crime to record uh, public officials uh, is unconstitutional. The First Circuit refused to um, decide that case, but it did say that it was very worried about the sorts of things Jamal was talking about, uh, including um, recording uh, people who are public servants, pick, um, cleaning up the park, for example, uh, and, and other things like that. And I think most importantly there, the First Circuit said uh, that um, we enjoy privacy even in public. And so in response then to a Project Veritas case that it doesn't even ultimately decide, it suggests that we do have privacy in public in the context of having some investigative journalist or not uh, recording us. So, so whatever the outcome is in these cases involving Project Veritas, it will have a profound effect on what we consider legacy media. Can I, can I just, I'll just add one other, since I'm the, I'm, I'm the one who always tries to throw pieces of context in. So um, uh, one thing to just keep in mind when it comes to James O'Keefe, some of, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to, 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 to say that some of his activities very well are protected and should be protected, and some may not be. Um, but there's also a question of what's the nexus between um, the uh, behavior he's trying to expose and the and the the public function of the particular entity. So if it's I'm going to try to um, get you to have an affair with someone um, because you are a public figure, um, is very different from I'm going to see if if the health department is willing to give a waiver to um, or, or overlook um, unsafe unsafe meat or something like that, um, uh, where where there's a if you're engaged in the same kinds of tactics to, to get at both of those things, I would think that um, a, a decision maker should think of those in, differently. Uh, unsurprisingly, um, folks who are chiming in in the chat and the Q and A have. Um, questions about other boundary testing examples that they would like to throw out to you all. I'm not at all interested in turning it into a, well, what about so-and-so and what about so-and-so and what about so-and-so um, panel? But I do think that there is some utility to um, using some of the examples that people throw out in trying to um, think about how the, the places where some of the line drawing might have to take place or some of the, um, even if we don't like the, the line drawing, 
um, decision making will have to take place about whether um, some of these additional protections that we're describing might um, exist or not exist. And um, uh, uh, so Linda Greenhouse uh, points out to us that the SCOTUS blog example is a really good one, right? The question of whether SCOTUS blog gets a seat in the, uh, in the gallery at, um, at the Supreme Court uh, uh, that is reserved for the press, the government's engaging in a line drawing determination about who's in and who's out there. And huge numbers of people um, rely on SCOTUS blog for their information about um, SCOTUS, <laughs> but um, are they the press for purposes of the um, press clause function that is happening there? Um, here are some other examples that I'll throw out and then uh, maybe you all can um, tussle with this set and um, tell us what it is that we learn about the task that we that we have to engage in. Um, uh, is Matt Drudge the press? Um, Sean Hannity, Alex Jones, uh, Human Rights Watch, uh, the NRA. Um, uh, what, um, what kinds of uh, what kinds of factors about, uh, in what ways do those entities engage in something that feels like or is a close cousin to the things we've described as the press function? And then what are the limiting factors that put us on the other end where we would think that if a court presented with these determinations might err on this, might uh, um, conclude that they, that they aren't engaging in a press function? Um, uh, what, what are the, um, the boundary principles that we're learning from some of those examples? Dave, you want to take a crack at some? Sure. Although I may I, I may sound like a broken record, but I I would go back to say, are they the press for what purpose? You know, Alex right. Jones or Sean Hannity, I mean, they have speech rights. You know, if they're sued for libel or defamation, or we know what the rules are, and it doesn't matter whether we call them the press or not. To me, again, where I where I think the the issue comes up and. And it's tied to the, the earlier panels about how we're going to fund the press, what regulations can we put on platforms and other things to separate out who's the press and who's not. SCOTUS blog, is it the press? Um, sure. I, I mean, I think it meets the definition. Uh, if you look again, I don't know what the, the Supreme Court rules are, but if you look at the Senate gallery rules, which are the rules that determine who gets access to the White House too, you have to have a qualify for a Senate press pass to be eligible for the White House. Those are, they're very detailed about the type of organization you must work with. And, and the question to me is, are, are those rules constitutionally mandated? I don't know. Could, could SCOTUS blog bring a, a constitutional claim if I think maybe if it was a content-based discrimination, um, perhaps, because if, you know, if, if they can qualify, the, the reasons we let the press into the Supreme Court is to, to record what's happening, to uncover wrongdoing, to promote it to the public. And if they're doing each of those functions, and they've been denied on some in, impermissible basis, then they might have a claim. Um, but to me, it's like the first question is, are they in the sphere of, of press and what would be protected? And I would say on that example, yes. Yeah, Dave, can I, um, can I ask just, um, just a, um, this is a piece that I've been sort of hearing echoes of over the course of, um, of this conference and in um, uh, in some of the scholarship in the space, and I'm just wondering, uh, maybe uniquely from um, your position at the at the Yale Clinic um, and your and the important work you've done on the access uh, questions, I've been wondering a lot about whether there is something important in that context about our identifying um, as a press function or identifying as the press. Um, like the press as a realistic proxy for some wider public that cannot reasonably access a space that needs access or observation or accountability, um, say, you know, reserved seats in the public gallery of the courtroom or um, the inside of the um, uh, immigration facility or the inside of jails. We can't all um, it, it's clear that we can't all go into the prison to see what the prison conditions are, but it also might be clear as a constitutional matter or as an accountability or watchdog matter, uh, tapping into some of the core functions that Jamal was suggesting should be on the scale in terms of the value judgments there, that um, it would be good for us to have that kind of check happening. Um, it, how do... Uh, how do those press as proxy considerations play out? And I guess more importantly, how should they? Well, well, I mean, they do play out. It, it, the press is, is regularly viewed as a proxy for the public. And it's an interesting, you know, historical quirk, I think, that, you know, in the Gannett, sorry, in Richmond newspapers, the Supreme Court was very specific that the access right is a public right, not a press right. 
And, um, but I, I'm only aware, I'm sure there've been others, but I'm aware of only one case in the last 40 years where an access issue was litigated, access to a court by an individual, as opposed to uh, a press acting as a proxy. It's the press who want access. And so I do think the, the, the presence of the press is important. I do think that in the right case, you could get, well, that there have been cases where the press is there as a proxy and therefore the press uniquely can, it has standing to assert this right. It stands in for the public, even though it's a public right. The difficult que questions are is when, when there is a constitutional access right, but you have to somehow allocate it. You know, I remember back way back when in the Microsoft antitrust case, I'm not sure how old I am, but which was a big deal at the time. There's actually a law that says, you know, that, that, that depositions in antitrust cases are open. And so there was this whole debate about does the press get to go to the pretrial depositions and who is the press for that purpose? And then when we got to trial, the judge said, we're only gonna allow the first row of seats for the press, the rest is for the public. Then you have a whole set of questions. Well, who qualifies to get in line to get one of those seats? And they're, they're not easy questions. You know, there's an argument you should, you should give them to the biggest organizations because they're gonna have the biggest audience reach and, and that's who you wanna get. And there's counter arguments of, well, what about specialized trade publications who really need to know about this case? Or So they're not easy questions, but I don't think those are so much constitutional questions as you know, the first question is, is there a constitutional access right? And then the next question is, can it be denied and who can it be denied to, which is less of a, I mean, I think the press does get a, a, a thumb on the scale there or, or a, an affirmative right um, in a number of cases. That's, so, I mean, that, that comes up all the time, the, these execution cases I mentioned. You know, no state says our executions are open and we're going to televise them. Although there was an interesting court in California, case in California several years ago where they tried to argue that there was a right to televise executions. But, but every state says there has to be witnesses. And that's a, a his, outgrowth of history where their executions used to be public. And so several courts have found that based on that history and based on the importance of public knowing how executions are carried out, that there is an affirmative right and that the press can assert that right to be present for the entire execution. Um, so the, it, it is a, I think, properly thought of as a press function. And how you define the press, again, I just keep going back to, are they engaged in the news gathering and dissemination and doing it on a regular basis, uh, et cetera. And so um, and this is a follow-up for Dave, but also I'm interested in the views of others. I've, I've heard uh, people sort of um, hinting at or gesturing towards the notion that a pre-existing audience is a factor that would that would matter or that would be key um, to to a press function and so how would new entrants um, ever achieve <laughs> that status if um, if it were the case that um, part of um, part and parcel of engaging in a press function for purposes of this expanded constitutional doctrine that was envisioned by the previous panel, um, if having a, a, a pre-existing audience was key to that, how do we get to a place where we have space to acknowledge the operation of um, the of what we think of as press functions by new entrants? Yeah, well, and it, it's one of those line drawing questions that aren't always easy. You know, courts have allowed the reporter's privilege to be asserted to first time authors. You know, they look at what their intent was. You know, uh, if someone was, says I was gonna be writing a book about this and they spend six months, you know, investigating it and then the DA wants all their notes. I think if they can establish their intent uh, and maybe other bona fides, you know, contract with a, uh, an entity, it doesn't matter necessarily that it's their first book, but it's gonna be context specific. Um, Jamal, does that track what, um, what you were thinking when you were talking about the pre-existing audience as being a key factor in establishing its space along the spectrum? Well, I, I, I think it's I think it's probably too abstract uh, asked in that in that way. Um, in addition to the it's exactly what Dave was mentioning in terms of um, trying to trying to just trying to make a, a judgment about intent. Um, uh, it, it's also a question of what is what are the values that the government is trying to promote. Um, uh, in the case of a SCOTUS blog, for example, uh, it, uh, others on the panel and in the audience, including Linda, will know more much more about these details than I do. But you know, one issue at the Supreme Court and, and other um, places is an issue of scarcity, right? So there's only so much space 
Um, if that's true, well, then you've got to make some judgments. And those judgments are, can't, are not judgments about you know, uh, who's, who's press and who isn't press. There's the number of people who, can, who qualify as press who want to cover the Supreme Court. Um, vastly exceeds the number of people who can who can actually be in that space, right? So, um, so when you're making those kinds of judgments, uh, I would be very reluctant to constitutionalize those judgments, given that we were, we're talking about trying to figure out some value judgments and trade offs on the on the margin. So, so I, I think I think it's just very specific to the particular situation. If there's no issue of scarcity, well, then it's then it then it becomes a, a, a different a very different question. Uh, uh, Amy, I want to hear your views on this, but I'm going to um, give the um, the further detail that Linda provides in the chat here, which is that SCOTUS log uh, doesn't qualify for um, congressional press gallery and hence not for the Supreme Court because of its ownership structure. It's owned by a law firm uh, and it has managed, um, as some of you know, an awkward workaround at the Supreme Court by um, finding someone who is affiliated elsewhere, um, but uh, it is actually not, not credentialed there. Um, but again, um, uh, maybe not, right, this is a subcategory of question about how it's happening, um, but maybe speaks to the broader question about how we treat audience reach um, as compared to other factors when we're making this determination in any setting. Uh, Amy. Yeah, and I think that the that today it's not a book that somebody's working on. I think it's an initial post. So it's something that uh, information posted uh, uh, without any sort of audience that then gains an audience. Uh, and in those cases, very recently, again, um, courts have decided that in fact, uh, the reporter's privilege does apply. So exactly what, what David says. Um, the, the one thing that I wanted to sort of push back on is um, this notion that uh, a journalist is uh, only doing um, good for the public. So, um, so uh, um, working uh, to, um, to explain uh, government and courts, uh, because of course, journalism has to be broader than that. It can't just be um, government focused. And so, uh, and so when we think about, for example, um, and this goes beyond uh, who is the press um, to, to think about um, what is journalism, what is newsworthy. If we, if we look at it, uh, is, if we define news as matters of public concern, that is extremely limiting. If we look at it as uh, matters of public interest, that's broader, and I think that's better for all of us. So what the public is interested in and not just what it should be interested in? Exactly right, yeah. Um, okay, I have a, um, a question here that was posted by Sonia and that loops back to something that um, has been a common thread um, on some of the uh, conversations that we've had in this panel, but also in the arc of this dialogue over the past 50 years or so. Um, and it is, it's that question of um, governmental involvement in our, our it, it, governmental involvement in articulating what is the press or which are the press functions, either statutorily um, or as a matter of constitutional doctrine. Um, Sonia says, going back to Chief Justice Berger's argument that if the court defined the press, it would be reminiscent of, of, reminiscent of a licensing scheme. Do you all think that there's any merit to his argument that the press is different in that the specific history of press freedom places, an additional, places additional constraints on any government attempt to define the press? Um, this, I will point out just for our listeners and viewers, um, was the primary position of the media bar, um, certainly at the time of um, uh, Brandsburg versus Hayes and other cases that there there was a re residual anxiety about defining the press or press functions for purposes of additional benefits because they may come um, combined with the um, heavy hand of government making determine any branch of government um, making determinations about who's in or out, which is itself reminiscent of this licensing question. Um, what what views do you all have on um, I guess the larger danger of the task? of having there be an individual press function protection that requires some um, determination of who's engaging in it and not. Uh, Jamal, I'll start with you and then make our way around. Sure, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of, of that analogy. Um, and for, for a couple of reasons, one is the, the idea that licensing is some kind of boogeyman. Um, 
is is something that doesn't sit well with me. Um, uh, it, it, it would sit well with me if what we were talking about here was the actual things that you're worried about in a licensing scheme, um, particularly one in the 18th century or or one in the 1950s, where you're where you're you're talking about distribution of particular kinds of content or publication, uh, and and there may be criminal penalties or or some kind of civil sanction or something for violating the license, and and that may not be that may you know you may not be able to collaterally attack um, the the underlying issue. Um, if you violated the licensing scheme. So those kinds of those kinds of process concerns um, and the substantive concerns are why we care about licensing schemes. If we're talking about press access and we're talking about issues of scarcity or issues of trying to figure out marginally whether uh, the press are, are, are able to break laws that other people uh, may not necessarily be able to break. Um, I, I don't. I, I just don't see the worry that I associate with licensing schemes applying in anywhere near the same way uh, as uh, as the as the, the traditional prior restraint context. I do think a prior restraint on reporting activity is more worrisome than an after the fact um, uh, a, um, um, sanction or, 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 or liability of some kind. Uh, but uh, but but the the Berger analogy that says anytime you define the press, you're walking into some kind of you know for First Amendment um, uh, you know hellscape. I, I just I just don't buy that. Yeah, Amy, did you have a thought on that? I I would agree, uh, and I think it's impossible to not do that now when everybody has access to um, to a printing press uh, with a click. Yeah, I, um, I, I think that uh, provides a really interesting bridge to um, a topic that I wanted to make sure that we hit on here and that uh, lots of folks have gestured towards over the course of the conference, which is the interrelationship between this question and some of the broader questions that have been raised um, in earlier panels about um, the new media landscape, right, um, citizen journalism and the um, the dissemination of information on matters of public concern through social media platforms and um, other um, non-traditional, non-legacy journalism outlets. Um, and uh, Martha Minow in our, in our previous panel um, sort of pointed out to us that a, a lot of these companies uh, spent a lot of time and energy at the front end emphasizing to us, you know, Facebook spent a lot of time emphasizing to us at the beginning that it's a tech company and not a press company, not a media company. Um, but um, Rasmus Klaus uh, uh, Nielsen uh, pointed out to us um, uh, earlier that uh, the statistics just sort of the data just demonstrates to us that a huge percentage of Americans who, uh, who are consuming any news at all are in fact consuming their news through these mechanisms, right? And so this, uh, the, the question of the interrelationship here I think um, matters a great deal, um, and it may matter for some of the um, the prior conversations that we we're having. We have a couple of questioners um, here who are asking questions about. Um, uh, we have a, a question about uh, a sort of digital outlets and um, the creation of community in digital outlets. Uh, many digital outlets have created new audiences through the creation of new editorial lines. Uh, carving out niches in digital uh, the digital media ecosystem and making communities within that space. Um, I'm interested in hearing uh, your views about um, what we might think of as which of the which of the sort of core uh, press functions that we might think of as um, in need of protection might be happening in those spaces and be worthy of um, protection in those spaces and um, and how uh, the the new media landscape complicates the uh, the answering of the questions. Amy, you want to start us off? Well, sure. I guess I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit just about how it's complicating things. I, I do think that we have a problem today uh, in which courts are, they, they don't understand what news is. Uh, and uh, And so because they don't understand what news is, they push back on, um, on they, they feel, I'll, I'll say it this way, they feel more confident in their own assessments of news judgment. And that's a very dangerous um, area to have courts uh, entering. Uh, and they're doing it more routinely now. Um, and, uh, and it's because of publishers who are in these 
spaces trying to get eyes uh, and publishing things that um, that traditional journalists wouldn't have previously. So, um, so as examples, um, uh, medical uh, history, uh, the example I used earlier um, of a videotape at a, a car accident scene um, of a person dying, uh, these sorts of um, these sorts of publications, I think, are uh, endangering uh, traditional uh, journalism at a time when traditional journalism can't afford it. Dave? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I think the question is, again, is, is what, what rights we're trying to, to be concerned about and in what context on social media. You know, I, I think the creation of forums and other things is really important. But I, I, from my perspective, in terms of like trying to create um, a, a, a constitutional basis of press clause protection. We need to keep coming back to the core functions of journalism and journalism directed to specific things, you know, investigative reporting, holding people accountable and developing a fact database. And so to me, when you look at that in social media, what we need to do is define what, what uh, aspects of social media are actually doing that function, not the distribution function, but the, the news gathering function. And I would just mention this a little bit off point that I think is really relevant that there has been a, a project for several years now in Europe called the Journalism Trust Project, promoted primarily by um, Reporters Without Borders. But it, its goal was to uh, create a mechanism for identifying reliable sources of news and coming up with a technological way to tag it uh, so as it goes from place to place on social media, you would know if it came from a reliable source. And to do that in a way that was not content-based, wasn't judging the truth or falsity of any particular story, but it was differentiating a news source. So in a sense, they were trying to define in the social media context, who should we consider as the press? And they came up with some, some really interesting detailed um, way of looking at it, but partly as we should we should give these press protections to entities that do a couple things from their perspective. One is they have to be uh, transparent. They have to disclose who their sources are, who their um, owner, you know, who their um, uh, management is, and they have to adhere to certain um, uh, standards of journalism. And those aren't well defined. There's, they can be adjusted, but it's an organization that says we're willing to be transparent about who we are and what we're doing. And here's what we're doing. And when we do it, we live up to these standards. And I think that, that there's an approach like that that says in social media, when we're talking about the rights that we really care about being protected under the press clause, particularly not the speech clause, that, that that's a way to define who should be eligible for those rights. Jamal, what's your sense of um, the way that the, um, the shifting ecosystem itself uh, complicates the endeavor we're trying to engage in? I'm, I mean, I'm not sure it complicates it all that much, um, at least, um, and I'll, I'll, I, I think, I think it, we, we have to be careful about exactly, as Dave said, what particular right is being asserted or what particular form of regulation we're talking about. I, I think in the US, the, the, the typical way in which um, the, the sort of social media if we're, if we're talking about how are social media groups regulated, um, they're regulated by, by, by platforms um, who have their own content rules and so forth. And I think there's a lot at stake in how platforms perform that function and those um, that, that, and, that, and the, the values that we associate with the press clause are also at stake in that kind of regulation. But for the most part, the press clause itself is not implicated um, in, in that, um, except to the degree that the platforms themselves might have some protection uh, under the First Amendment. Uh, uh, if we're talking about news gathering and reporting, I mean, I, I would just go back to the to the earlier conversation, which it, it, it just the fact that the fact that um, information is being disseminated disseminated through social media, um, I think, um, is not. You know, doesn't doesn't take it out of that space. Uh, uh, um, uh, although the same kinds of questions about what kind of institution we're talking about are are the you know are are the, are the same kinds of questions you'd ask about about social media. Um, uh, so so I I I think it it just depends on what what kind of what situation we're talking about. What's the who's the regulator? 
what's the what's the privilege being sought and so forth yeah i think that's really helpful um uh, in our last minutes, I wanted to touch on one additional question that has emerged in um, some previous panels. Uh, one set of, uh, we're sort of thinking about structural solutions for resolving the crisis of the press and particularly the diminishment of local news in the US. Um, there are, uh, from a number of different voices and vantage points, we've heard suggestions about um, the possibility of government subsidies, right? Um, um, money that goes to individual consumers who, uh, who uh, you know, credit that they could use to, um, to support a news entity or to engage in a subscription, um, uh, various um, government benefits to existing press organizations or to startup press organizations. Um, and I'm um, wondering if we could just spend our last couple of minutes uh, sort of describing from our own vantage point the kinds of features we would want those recipients to have um, uh, in order to qualify in that space, uh, if we're sort of defining the press for that purpose, um, who ought to be elevated affirmatively by um, some sort of government um, subsidy, what kinds of features would you want to see in those entities? And, uh, what would be the key dividing lines? Um, Amy, you want to so, start? Us? Yeah, the, great. Thank you. Uh, one of the um, one of the things I think that does differentiate uh, plain old publishers from journalists, journalists would say, is abiding by an ethics code, something David just mentioned. Uh, and so that's something I would like to see. That would be a differentiation point for me um, to uh, look into uh, what uh, ethics um, that publisher practiced uh, and why. And in your view, um, uh, that wouldn't be that wouldn't be a content based um, determination uh, because it would be about practices they had in place and not content that they were publishing. Exactly. Yes. Dave, thoughts? Yeah, I, I think there's actually a model that that could be very useful in this context, and that's how how we regulate colleges and universities in this country. There's a huge diversity. Uh, there's you know religious schools, uh, uh, schools that are teach the great books, schools that teach other things, um, but they're regulated through through non-governmental accreditation. And I think that model would have a lot uh, of benefits here. You know, if you had uh, organizations or individuals, could be both, who had to be accredited by some non, non-governmental agency, subject to some standards like, like the, uh, the trust project in, in, in Europe, uh, th that is not content based, but it's like, what do you do and how do you do it? And if you meet certain standards, you get accredited and then you would be eligible for whatever the government function is. So you, you could, people could get tax credits by giving to you or that you could get direct subsidies. You know, colleges, uh, if they're not accredited, their students can't get government loans. I think that system could be non-content based. It could be primarily non-governmental. You could have uh, enforcement mechanism. You'd lose your accreditation if you didn't live up to your standards, uh, and it and it sidesteps some of the thornier issues. I, I think it's a model worth thinking about. Oh, final thoughts? Uh, sure, and I'll I'll just agree um, uh, and and note that colleges and universities you know do receive federal funding um, uh, for scientific and medical research primarily. Um, I think no reason why an accredited school or accredited institution, news gathering institution could not um, uh, go through an accreditation process, receive funding from um, some government pool. I think that's a good idea, um, generally speaking. Um, there's non-discrimination guarantees, there's legal questions that arise on the margins, those kinds of things. But um, I, I'll, I, and I'll just emphasize, you know, as someone who used to be a professional fact checker um, at, a, at a news organization, Right, that you know, one of those factors can be could could be um, do you have do you train do you train your reporters in some way? Um, do you have a fact checking process of some kind? Um, you know, those are those are if we're if we're talking about governmental subsidies, right? What are the values that we think are missing that need to be promoted through through resources? And uh, and I think those are uh, those are um, uh, you know, professional truth gathering, and that goes to, to ethics, but it also goes to training. Yeah, I'll just I'll just note um, from my own work that that's something that I have emphasized and that I think um, uh, that sometimes there's anxiety about um, bringing um, fact checking or um, the, tr the truth or falsity of information into the fray, but there's a big, big difference between um, the government declaring what you do true or false and the government looking at whether you have a process in place <laughs> 
for engaging in, in fact checking, right? One of them is a content based determination and the other is an advancement of a goal. You might, you might have accidentally or negligently produced some material that wasn't fully factual. Um, but what we're looking at is um, in the individual instance, whether you're an, um, an entity or operator um, who engages in that kinds of behavior. So I think that's an interesting dynamic. All right, um, our time is up. Um, I hope that everyone will join me in um, expressing so much thanks uh, to our panelists for um, tussling with this very complicated and multi-faceted uh, uh, question. And we're gonna turn the time to Jack now um, to uh, tie a ribbon around uh, this the conference proceedings. Uh, thanks uh, to, to Dave and Amy and Jamal for their efforts here. Yep. Thanks you, Ronell. Thank great. you.